All right. Thank you. If you are looking for a Kubernetes talk that is tailored to Postgres, then you're in the right place. My name is Adam Wright. I'm a product manager at EDB relevant to today's topic. Um, back in 2020, I was working on a Kubernetes operator um, and EDB and second quadrant joined forces. Um, and they had an operator that wasn't yet released. I transitioned to product management and my very first job was to decide whether we release this operator that I had been heavily involved with or we go with this new operator. Um, and that operator was cloud native Postgres. A couple of years later, we released it as open source and try to donate it to an independent organization for um, maintenance. Um, today, um, well, so in the, those years after that, I talked to a lot of Postgres DBAs and there's a lot of information out there about Kubernetes. It's a huge topic. Um, and then there's a lot of Postgres operator talks as well. And they're very focused on that particular operator. Um, and so I talked to DBAs and typically the conversation would go, hey, our applications are moving to Kubernetes. We've been asked to evaluate the database. Help me out here. Um, so I tried to fill the gap between like specific operator knowledge and what uh, Postgres DBA actually needs to know about Kubernetes. Um, so that's what I hope to accomplish here today. Um, on the agenda, you know, an introduction to Kubernetes, we need a level set so no one is lost in five minutes. Um, then we'll discuss what a Postgres DBA actually does, um, how this these day-to-day -day tasks might change when they move to Kubernetes. Um, and then we'll also talk about some other things at Kubernetes that you might need to be aware of. Yeah, as Postgres people, we're very proud to be a part of this very strong, vibrant open source community. There are some similarities with um, Kubernetes. They both have very liberal licenses. Um, they are both governed by a body that tries to ensure vendor neutrality, not just maintenance of the code. Um, I had to update the uh, first part earlier um, or yesterday based on the wonderful keynote that we have, but there's you know, 700 plus contributors for the PostgreSQL community. Uh, Kubernetes is a large project. There are thousands of uh, contributors, but both are really good examples of strong open source communities. All right, so let's talk about Kubernetes here. Um, just a quick show of hands. How many people are familiar with Kubernetes already? I feel like they have a good understanding. All right. I'll, uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but just bear with me for about five minutes for the people that um, aren't really too familiar with Kubernetes. Ten plus years ago, the Linux kernel gets sandboxing features. The original use case was something like multiple home directories. Docker, Docker Inc. comes along and popularizes application containers, namespace containers. Um, and these are really good for solving the problem of, hey, this application ran fine on my laptop. Two things it didn't do is cover scheduling, which includes rescheduling and also resource utilization. So if I have 1,000 servers and a new app needs to go online, I don't need to have 1,001 servers just find a place that has the sufficient resources to run my application. So the thing for us is out of Google comes this really clean API, it's a project called Kubernetes, and it allows you to say, hey, here's how many resources my application has, just go and find a place to run it. So it handles the scheduling and it also handles um, the resource aspect of it as well. Uh, Kubernetes is often referred to as a data center OS. If you think about your cloud console, you go in and you see many services. Well, Kubernetes has many services for managing your application. It has a DNS server built in. It's got load balancing, scheduling. Um, it's also got like these enterprise-y cron services for job scheduling. It also has a pluggable um, interface. So if you take something like a load balancer, for example, um, you might have a, a service type called load balancer. If you're running on AWS EKS, that's automatically going to hook into AWS's Elastic Load Balancer. If you're on-prem, that same application manifest is going to hook into something like an F5 service load balancer. So what you get with Kubernetes is you get these repeatable patterns. So if you need to deploy many Postgres databases, hundreds of Postgres databases, it's really easy to do. Um, you could do it on premise, you could do it in the cloud, you can extract a lot of that infrastructure away. 
Um, and then it also enables development speed. So your development team, they could package up the application, they could package up the database together, they could run in their CI CD pipeline for testing. Um, you know, we're no longer operating in the days of a, a two week change ticket to get a database. You know, it's just an API call away. So Kubernetes has all these great features. Well, why do we need an operator then? Why not just pull a container image down from Docker Hub, run it as a replica with a stateful set? So Postgres is an application, but it's a complex application. If you have a web server, you might have a replica set of three. And if something happens to one of those containers, Kubernetes is going to remove it from the service, and then it's going to automatically heal that. So it's going to either going to bring it back or reschedule that container to add it back to the service, and no one is none the wiser. Um, but Postgres, it's an application, but it's a complex application. So you have a primary, you might have two standbys. That primary is at the furthest most point. The standbys are at a, um, a point relative to that primary. And if something, Kubernetes doesn't have Postgres knowledge, so if something happens to the primary, there's a lot of decisions that need to be made. Which standby do we promote? Should we bring the old primary back as a standby? Do we need to run PG Rewind? We need to reconfigure the other standby to follow the new primary. Um, a lot of the stuff, the expertise that we have at this conference, PostgreSQL hackers, operational DBAs, the operators get us, give us a way to take that expertise program it in and hook into Kubernetes so we can extend Kubernetes. Um, trying to think if there's anything else about Kubernetes. Yeah, so that's why we actually need an operator. So we're going to extend the Kubernetes API. Um, one last bit of level setting, and this is a bit of a, a mindset shift, is around declarative versus imperative. Um, you know, imperative is all the run books that we have. As DBAs, we've all done these run books. Hey, here's how you set up high availability and you go through all the steps. Um, the best way I've heard this described is that of a chocolate cake. Um, true story, one of my daughter's birthdays was last month and she wanted a chocolate cake. So we had a couple of options. One is we could have drove to the store, bought flour, bought cocoa, sugar, butter, eggs, drove home, set the oven to 350 degrees go through all the steps to bake a chocolate cake. Or we could tell the baker, hey, we want a chocolate cake. We want stereotypical Barbie on it. And they're going to produce a cake and hopefully it makes our daughter happy. Um, so that's the declarative way. So as Postgres people, we just tell Kubernetes, hey, we want instances three, which infers one primary, two standbys. Um, an important aspect here is that of reconciliation loops. So, you know, we have a running Postgres cluster, things happen. Um, so, you know, this, this is kind of like setting the heat in your room. So you might turn the heater on, set it to 70 degrees. The thermostat's going to continuously monitor the temperature in your room. And when the temperature goes below 70 degrees, it's going to kick into action, run the heat, and bring the temperature back to what you set it to. Um, so this is a visualization of that for Postgres. Let's say, hey, we want instances three. That's a primary and two standbys. We're going to put that request. It's going to go to the cluster store, which is going to be etcd in most cases. We're going to bootstrap a new primary, a new standby, a third standby, and now our desired state and our actual state match. If something happens to one of our containers, the standby, we're either going to try to bring that back and heal it or we're going to bring a new one back online. Now a desired state and our actual state match again. Something happens in the primary. We have all those complex decisions that need to be made. Standby gets promoted. And then we could also add more replicas. We might have um, you know, heavy workload, and we're going to add um, another replica. That's going to get posted to the API. You're going to post that change to the API server, and then a new instance is going to be added to your cluster. Um, and then you could drop that back as well. You know, if you're a Postgres person and you're looking for an operator, there are lots of operators out there. Um, most use Patroni for high availability. Some notable exceptions, you know, port works on the bottom right. You know, if you have a pure storage flash array, that might be a reason to use them. Cloud Native PG on the top left, um, it's Apache 2.0 license. It was written by a bunch of Postgres vets. 
and it uses its own instance manager rather and hooks into the Kubernetes API server rather than using another high availability tool. Um, the Crunchy operator, there's a whole session yesterday dedicated to this. Um, the Percona operator is a fork of the Crunchy operator. They've swapped out PG Monitor for their own Percona monitoring and management tool. Um, Zalando um, has been around for a while. It's uh, very popular. Um, so there, there are no shortage of choices. This is not even all of them. I work for E2B. We even have like an LTS version of, of Cloud Native PG. Um, but it's really easy. You know, if you want to kick the tires, get started. It's really easy to deploy an operator. How do you deploy an operator? Um, if you're an open shift, ignore this one. But you would normally just deploy it with your manifest file. Um, these are just stolen from the quick start guides on these projects. Really easy to get started. All right, we installed an operator. What actually happened? Well, we have new Kubernetes API objects. A controller is activated by that operator and then reconciliation loops begin. Um, this shot here is just, um, you can just inspect, you know, the Kubernetes, um, you can just use standard kubectl, um, which is the tool for interacting, querying the Kubernetes server. You can think of this like uh, PSQL, um, but for Kubernetes, um, just for show, I have the Zalando operator, um, Cloud Native PG, and Stackress on there, just, just to show, hey, we have these new API objects out there. So this controller that's activated, the type, you know, for using Cloud Native PG as an example, we have a new type. It's a custom resource. It's got a cluster. That cluster has its schema, right? So it's got a number of fields. It's made up of things like instances, um, synchronous replication. You know, if you're deploying an operator, you really should not be executing into your container and you know modifying the PostgreSQL.com to set up synchronous replication. You're going to define these fields um, in your deployment file. Um, in the custom resource definition, you can view that um, either through a project's documentation or you can query the uh, Kubernetes API server to get that information. All right, so we deployed an operator. We have our custom resource definition. Um, we, you know, if you do an actual deployment um, of your Postgres cluster um, and you need to update it, you know, what, what actually happens. Um, so let's just say we have a cluster that's running. It's got instances three. We want to set up synchronous, or in this case, we have um, instances five. We want to configure synchronous replication. So we use kubectl apply. Uh, Kubernetes has restful verbs. Since we're updating a spec, it's going to do a put. It's going to go to the cluster store and etcd. The operator is continuously monitoring that. So it's going to say, hey, there's a change that's being made. And then a logger is going to be initialized. Um, this is critical for debugging. Um, this is also critical for tracking the reconciliation process. Um, something that varies among the operator is you have conditional validation that happens as Postgres people, or if you've been working with Postgres enough, you will have updated the PostgreSQL conf in a way where the postmaster doesn't start. Um, it's happened, it surely it's happened to most everyone who's worked with Postgres long enough. Um, so you, you have your fields that are well-defined, but then you can also inject logic to make sure you don't actually update the PostgreSQL conf um, in a way that's not gonna be valid. So this is a simple case, but if we're setting up synchronous replication, you know, the operator can um, inject itself and make sure that we're not deploying more synchronous replicas that, or, or setting max synchronous replicas to more standbys that we actually have in the cluster. Um, then a deep copy occurs. So the state is saved off separately. Um, and then we're going to sync, you know, does our spec status and our actual status match. And then we're going to patch the application. And then our reconciliation loops are going to happen again. The actual status or, or desired status and our current status is going to match. And then there's no action to be taken. Um, one warning, I, you know, I referenced the custom resource definitions. There are no standard cuff, uh, custom resource definitions. Not a big deal, but they're not going to match um, between the different operators. Um, there is this data on Q, uh, Kubernetes group. Um, they work on such things as like operator evaluations. You know, how can you pick the right ones? Standardized custom resource um, definitions. 
Postgres people, you know, we enjoy being part of an open source community. If you're interested in databases, you're interested in Kubernetes, um, there's lots of volunteer work, um, you know, not just, shouldn't just be project maintainers, but actual users that you know, go in and help defining these things. So in this example, you know, there's different ways to um, say how many standbys that you're actually going to want in your cluster. All right, I'm just going to do a quick demo here just to show how easy it is. Um, is Hopefully that's readable to everyone. I'm going to first, oh, sorry, caught this before I actually made an error. All right, so I'm going to create a new deployment. And just to show, this is, I'm using Cloud Data PG as an example, um, but you can see here's the operator that's running. It's a deployment type, um, and it's got these API resources. So if I grab Postgres, in this case, we have backup, cluster image catalog, cluster image um, pooler, um, and scheduled backups. So the formatting is a little off because so I zoomed in. And so these are the multiple reconciliation loops that uh, Cloud Native PG has. Now to show you what's actually in that spec. Um, so this is PGHA Dolores. This is just a logical name for my cluster. Um, you can see the API server that we're using up there, PostgreSQL cnpg.io, the image name that we're using. We want instances three. Um, but this, uh, the, the really cool thing is, is all our parameters, right? We're not going into the PostgreSQL conf and setting up things like PG audit. This is you know, automatically happening with our operator. Um, something else that's happening is we're defining our application database at the time we initialize the cluster. So we're saying, hey, Kubernetes create a database called Shogun World make the owner Mave, and then set the password to the values that are in this secret. Um, and since this is a Kubernetes deployment, I can just use um, Kubernetes commands like get pods. Um, I can also get logs. Um, so PGHA Dolores. Um, so these are all of my pod logs that are going out to standard out. Um, the really cool thing here is, you know, if you're using like a log um, collection service, you're going to have a history of your cluster from the very beginning, um, which is really cool. So you're actually going to see where um, like the PG, uh, the PG audit extension was created. All right, you might have to trust me on this one. Yeah, so there you can see like create extension, PG audit, we're logging everything. So it is possible you can have a history from the very beginning um, of your cluster creation. You know, that's something that's going to be a little bit more difficult to do with virtual machines. Um, you can use plugins, right, uh, from the project. CNP G status. So like uh, Cloud Data PG, for example, has a plugin for kubectl. We're just getting this information and putting it in a format that's going to be, sorry about that, that's going to be a little bit more familiar and readable for DBAs. I'm going to see if there's anything else. Oh, I'll just show real quick. Oh, sorry. So you can see that PG audits installed. So as a DBA, I never had to like exec into the container, run, you know, create extension PG audit. And I am going to run something here and not talk about it, but I will talk about it later. All right. All right, so what changes as a DBA if you're going to use Kubernetes? Um, to answer that question, we first need to, you know, describe what a DBA does all day. Um, if you go in and do just do like a Google search and you type what does a DBA do, do, what does a DBA do? Towards the top of the search results, there's going to be this Tech Republic article. It's not perfect, but it's kind of sort of close to what a PostgreSQL DBA is going to spend a lot of time doing. 
So like installation, configuration, upgrade, you know, setting up HA, things like that. That's definitely within the, the job duties of a DBA, Postgres DBA security. Undoubtedly, if you're a Postgres DBA, you have documentation, you have a confluence page that says, hey, before we can release this database um, to production, these are all the steps we have to go through to harden our database. Um, storage and capacity planning, undoubtedly talking to the storage administrators, explaining Postgres. Hey, you know, PG Data uses random I.O., the wall uses sequential I.O., you know, what storage is best for our use case. We're going to be setting up um, alerts, you know, if you have slow application queries, um, if you need to do troubleshooting, hey, here's, you know, the relevant extensions, PG stat statements, run a PG um, Badger report. Backup and recovery, definitely that's going to be imperative. Hey, we're going to, every six months, we're going to do a disaster recovery exercise. You know, we're going to test PG base backup. We're going to test tools like Barman, test tools like uh, PG backrest. So I, I think it's you know, not perfect, but fair. Um, so we'll just go through those installation, configuration, upgrade, and migration. So the installation configuration, you know, that's declarative. That's going to be you know dead simple as we um, shown. Migration. Um, I'm thinking about this a, a couple of ways, migrations from other databases, but I was thinking more of migrations from virtual machines to Kubernetes. Um, there's documentation um, that Cloud Native PG has for importing. Chances are you're not going to be able to take your base backup and just drag that into Kubernetes. Uh, there might be some cases where it works because it's going to be a little bit more difficult. You have things like system libraries that need to match. Um, for for certain extensions, and the reality is, you just have a little bit less control. Um, I'm a big fan of using logical replication. There's things you need to operationalize, you know, around sequences, DDLs. Um, but I, I'm a big fan of just using logical replication to get from virtual machines to Kubernetes. It's not the only way. Um, same with upgrades. Um, these capabilities are going to vary by operator. Um, if you are execing into the container and running PG upgrade, if that's the way the project says to do it, that's a huge red flag. Um, that's not how you should be doing it. Um, some operators might do things like, okay, we're going to have another container. We're going to orchestrate PG upgrade, and then we're going to swap out the containers, right? We have a 16 container and the 17 containers. So these are going to vary by operator, but, you know, these are things that you're going to want to evaluate, um, again, like it's so easy to do a deployment in Kubernetes. I prefer to just use logical replication if I'm going to have to do a major version upgrade, but I'm also someone who used Sloney for nearly 10 years to do upgrades. Um, database security. This is one that changes quite a bit in uh, Kubernetes. Um, there's this 4C security model in Kubernetes. As a Postgres DBA, you're going to be responsible for the container that you pull in. Um, you're also going to be responsible for the code. The code is Postgres. Um, I think this is an area that really improves for the better in Kubernetes. If you take some of like the operational tasks that are very heavy, um, things like SSL certificates, for example, even if you're getting you know your corporate SSL certificates um, you know provided to you. You have to copy those around, shmod, save, you know, file system permissions, um, you know, SCP those around using open SSL to do self-signed certificates. You know, it's a very operational heavy task. Um, these are things like a not good operator can make your life a lot easier. So it can do things like generate SSL certificates for you. I'm not sure how all the um, different operators compare in this area, but just again, to use Cloud APG as an example. The operator will look at your spec when you create a new deployment and say, you know, look, did you provide like a, a corporate uh, SSL certificate? If you didn't, generate a CA and set up SSL authentication automatically. So you're going to by default have client server communication without having to do anything. Oh, so again, like a good operator is going to be secure by default. Um, so I, I think the security story improves for Kubernetes, despite not having strict kernel isolation like a virtual machine would. It's you know better to think about it like kernel segmentation rather than isolation. But you know if, if you're using a virtual machine, you don't often think about how that process interacts um, with the Linux kernel. You know most you know the, the extent people go to most of the time is just turn SE Linux off and uh, be on with it. 
Um, there are the pod security context. There's container security context. Um, I guess to, to map this to Kubernetes, uh, to back to Postgres, you have like your PostgreSQL comp, which has all your cluster configurations, and then you could override that at lower context, right? So you set your PostgreSQL.conf up, and then you might have a database. We say alter database foo set some value, you know, set some parameter to some value. Um, what we have here, this is just the default. So I just um, use kubectl to, to list out um, the pod in container security context. Um, what this is telling us is to run with a UID of 26. So this is the reserved Unix ID for Postgres. Um, on the container level, th this is really going to be the, the weakest link here. Um, you can have multiple containers in a pod right and they're going to share memory they're going to share networking so you know the, the security is only as good as that lowest level here um but what you're seeing there is by default you know an operator can you know really implement the principle of least privilege um so you know allow privilege escalation capabilities drop all you don't need to really remember all this you can look it up but what that's is telling us is hey we can't run something like set uid and you know run up as the root user um, we can't go and modify the system clock or modify networking. So this is all enforced. Um, root only file system, you know, Postgres people, this this takes, um, you know, a little bit of a mindset shift too. So I have a container image. It's got my PostgreSQL libraries. It sets the version. Um, but the only thing that really needs to be writable is the PG data. So this ensures, you know, someone can't inject malicious code um, into the container. Um, there are, I, I have seen, I have worked with some customers that have like a hydration process and, you know, for security, they'll do things like, Hey, this container hasn't been restarted in 30 days, go ahead and restart it. Um, so there's some things like that to look at, you know, if you have some corporate policies like that, um, I think that's it for that slide. There is something that's pretty hot out there right now called software bill of material reports or S bombs. So you're responsible for the container. You're pulling this container down onto your corporate network. Not only does it come with Postgres, but it also comes with a number of system libraries. You know, if you're using something like Red Hat or using something like Debian, you know, you do yum install, um, apt install, and typically your corporate policies are going to you know, um, restrict you to what um, software repositories you can resolve from. Like if you're using Red Hat, for example, you might have EPL blocked, um, but your container images, like it, it contains everything. So what did you actually pull onto your corporate network? Um, you can ask the project maintainers, you know, to provide a software bill of materials report. Um, you can use these yourselves so if you just want to see what one looks like. There's like a tool like Sift that you can just blast at, um, you know, like a public image or your local image. And it's going to it's going to list out all the libraries that are included with that container image, along with the version. And then if you have a, um, like a vulnerabilities database, you can match those up. There's also the licensing aspect. You know, you might have a corporate policy that says we can't pull AGPL code onto our network. Um, or there might, you know, someone might slip a commercial piece of software um, into the container, and now you're on the hook for some sort of licensing terms around there. There are some container repositories that will generate S bombs um, by default. So, like the uh, Department of Defense Iron Bank repository, you know, it has it's part of its pipeline. It generates an S bomb from Sift. Um, even if you don't store something in the Iron Bank repository, it's pretty good motivation for something that you could set up in your own CI CD pipeline. Um, storage and capacity capacity planning. Um, storage is a huge topic in Kubernetes. It, you know, it's enough to fill a book. It's enough for someone like Gabrielli to fill an entire KubeCon talk on. Um, but if you're just worried about Postgres and you're not really pushing the limits with like multi terabyte databases. I think it becomes um, a little bit easier to understand um, the topics a little bit more narrow because um, you're not going to do things like, oh, I'm going to manually go create a persistent volume. Then I'm going to uh, create a persistent volume claim. Now let's go ahead and do our Postgres deployment. You're going to have a pers um, you're going to have a storage class that can dynamically provision um, the persistent volume for you. Um, 
all the things that as a Postgres person, you already know about storage. All of that applies in Kubernetes. Kubernetes is not magic. You still need, you know, guaranteed IOPS. You still need good random IO. You need good, um, for PG data. You still need good sequential IO for the, the wall. Um, all of those things apply. Um, we have had support cases where you just took the default storage that was there. Um, and so like some of the cases would be, hey, we have a RAID 5 or RAID 6 array, which with cache isn't as bad as most people think, but we have 100 containers that are writing to it along with the database. And you know the, the performance is going to suffer. And it's not because of Kubernetes. It's because of the storage configuration. Um, storage types, you do have some flexibility there. Like you can you know, just dedicate a post, uh, Kubernetes node to Postgres. You could also use local storage in that case. So if you want to use Kubernetes and you're really pushing the limits of a single Postgres cluster, you know, you do have other options. Um, you, you have some very flexible options there. Uh, performance monitoring and tuning. Um, benchmarking in Kubernetes is critical. Um, PG Bench, you know, if you mentioned PG Bench um, in a Postgres audience, the first thing you typically hear is, well, that's not really relevant um, to our application. But the thing that PG Bench is really good at is relative performance comparisons. Um, so you could run PG Bench, say, in your virtual machine environment where your database is meeting its SLAs, run those same PG Bench benchmarks in Kubernetes and compare those two. Um, if you're not familiar, the most common stack for Kubernetes workload, Prometheus and Grafana, so Prometheus for metrics, Grafana for dashboards. Um, the image up there on the top right is the sample of dashboards from the Cloud Native PG project. I think almost all Postgres operators provide um, some sort of metrics exporter and Prometheus um, or Grafana dashboards. Um, you can look at things a little bit differently too, like those can just serve as inspiration. You know, if you're really embracing microservices, you might just have a microservices view where you sort of marry up the application and the database in one view. So here's my login API, and we're looking at everything at once. So you really have a lot more um, options in, in Kubernetes, or it's easier to, to uh, go with those options in Kubernetes. Enterprise monitoring solutions. So I've worked with a lot of customers who have, you know, some commercial monitoring or logging system. A lot of the traditional ones we found really haven't kept up with Kubernetes. So if you need to like add a um, agent to the container, that's probably unfortunately not going to work out for you. Some might have um, have found a way to provide a sidecar container. Back to the security thing, you need to look at what sort of permissions that it actually needs. Um, the same with like backup vendors um, in Kubernetes. A lot of a lot of the traditional ones just aren't going to be a great option in Kubernetes. So if you're, if you're using some sort of commercial monitoring solution, you know, it is something to be aware of upfront as you're evaluating operators. Um, logging is typically different in Kubernetes. You know, you could, like I had those um, pod logs, we could send that to a centralized place. We can run queries on those, um, things like Elasticsearch. There are many other projects here. Um, so, so you have new options available to you. Um, you're typically going to get your Postgres logs off the container. Um, I'm someone who really liked PG Badger reports. Um, so there's different ways that you might have to set those up. When I was a Postgres consultant for many years, you know, if I had to go on site with a client, you know, I always asked for like a PG Badger report before I actually got there. I could look at it on the plane. And I kind of had a really good sense of what that cluster was going to look like before, you know, I even got there. Um, so you, and you can mimic some of those as, as well um, differently. Uh, but PG stat statements, explain plans, all the many of the tools that you use today, you know, those are still available. Those are still valuable um, in Kubernetes. Um, backup and recovery, um, like HA, I think this one changes for the better. You're really getting away from the imperative workflow to the declarative workload, uh, to the um, comparative uh, imperative versus declarative. So you know. You really should just tell the operator, here's where I want my backup. Here's how often I want you to take my backup. You shouldn't get so married to the tools that are being used. Um, so, so this is a, a big mindset shift. You know, the, the, the operator uh, maintainers should be the ones that have tested that backup and restore process. You know, you're ultimately going to validate that. 
but you have new tools in Kubernetes, right? So if you have like a multi-terabyte database and you have a particular tool, you know, in a virtual machine, maybe something like Kubernetes volume snapshots are going to be a better option for you. So my piece of advice here is don't get too married to a particular tool that you're using today. Um, another piece um, of this is we've worked with service providers that um, you know are managing hundreds of Postgres databases, and this gets really challenging at scale. There are some new backup tools um, like Valero and others that do like namespace level backups. I'm right not recommending those necessarily, um, but I've kind of come around and been a little bit more open minded to it. So if you have a true disaster recovery scenario, not just oh this one database cluster needs to be restored, but in a true disaster recovery scenario. And you can restore these snapshots. So I'm going to restore restore this entire namespace to this consistent point in time. Um, you know, th those are the things those types of tools um, can provide. Again, it's just something to be aware of. Um, one other thing is, you know, that's different with backups. Um, you're going to want to evaluate, you know, how backups are getting off of that container. So if you have something like wall archiving, you know, the performance against object stores can vary quite a bit. At EDB, we've done a lot of benchmarking in this area. Performance really varies, even with a particular cloud environment, like different regions might perform dif um, differently. So it's not really consistent. Um, you know, the, the best ideas I've seen are, you know, being able to stream that wall off to a persistent volume and then ship it off. So you sort of have this, you know, middle piece where you can get the wall archives off because the thing that could happen is well if wall archiving is not keeping up and then a switch over happens that container goes away now we have a gap in our backup timeline and it can be difficult to detect that all right uh postgres extensions you know they're great they're popular um you know the postgres ecosystem is a far better place because of them um you know, there's like PG Vector is a very fast moving pro uh, project. It's not, you know, tied to the rigid schedule of a Postgres major release. Um, and then PostGIS, you know, has specialized, requires specialized skills that aren't necessarily in core. Um, so, you know, getting those here container images, you don't want to just load up the container image with every single extension. Something like PostGIS, you know, that's going to pull libraries from, you know, the operating system. So, you know, the, the best recommendation I have today is you could use like a, a container provider's base image and then add your extensions on top of this. This does put some operational overhead on you as a container consumer, but it is better than the alternative of having to load these up. Um, there is some future hope that marries up um, a PostgreSQL proposal in the community with a Kubernetes feature that is in alpha. And this is having mold, uh, direct uh, extensions um, fully contained within a directory. Um, and then there's OCI artifacts on um, this container, um, standardized container images. So this allows you to have a base image and then add these OCI artifacts. Um, the one thing that's gonna be a little bit tricky is some of the extensions that pull in like multiple OS libraries, um, like PostGIS, for example. Okay, we're putting those in the container images. You know, instead of pulling those for EPEL or something like that, we're putting those in the libdir directory. And, you know, now we've become a, a supply chain for all these other things that were um, operating system dependent. All right, so real quick here. Um, I'm actually running a little bit short on time. So I am going to go declarative update here so i'm going to do select version and we're running postgresql 16.3 and i'm going to edit my cluster um, this is not the way you would normally do it but this is just for show here i'm going to change this to 16.4 i would have liked to have used 17 Um, but there's no minor release of 17 yet. So if this would have been next month, I would have used uh, version 17. Um, so the, yeah, so this is going to show a declarative update. So I didn't go into the container and run yum update and get PostgreSQL 16.4 and then um, you know, restart the container. 
Um, so this is going to take a second because what's happening is there's a rolling update that's happening. So we're going to go from third standby, second, third standby, and then the primary and update that. All right, so we can see that we now have 16.4. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm running a little bit short on time. You can also do like PG update like or, or PG audit, like if I would have went in, deleted all the PG audit parameters, then PG audit would have been removed. Um, you can also do things like, you know, instead of going into the container, running PG bench, you can just have a job that initializes PG bench. Um, so you have a, a really a programmatic way to um, standardize those benchmark tests. All right, so what else should a DBA know about Kubernetes? Um, there's a lot of tools in the toolbox when you're working with Kubernetes. There's labels and annotations, taints and tolerations, affinity, anti-infinity. You can marry network policies with labels. Um, there's a whole host of things that you can do. Um, these are really for like doing system identifiers and controlling scheduling of um, your pods. So, you know, there, there's no hierarchy, no relationships in Kubernetes. Um, I also find that pe uh, people tend to mix production and development more um, in Kubernetes, you know, usually like a, a VM environment. So here's our production VM environment. Here's our test VM environment. Some people do that with Kubernetes, but I find that they get mixed a lot more. Um, so you can do things like label your test database, and then it's discoverable by your applications. Um, and then annotations, you can also just add, that allows you to add some metadata to, um, to your cluster. So in this example, production copy, Tuesday, um, Tuesday, October 22nd, this is my May solver application, the database. Um, Kubernetes worker nodes can have labels for any purpose, you know, so you can have a Kubernetes worker that's dedicated to a database. If you have an analytics database, you can, you know, find a Kubernetes worker node that has um, a lot of L2 cache um, location as well. Um, Kubernetes networking for DBAs, if you're just kicking the tires, um, you know, you can do something like port forward. So if you have a like kind on your desktop, you do port forward, it's going to be 5432 of your um, local machine, node port, Kubernetes has like a range of IP addresses, and you can match your service IP to um, 5432. Um, let me just show that real quick. So like in, in this example, um, these are the services that were created automatically. So we have this read-write service, and it's looking for a cluster named PGHA Dolores that has the instance role of primary. And then if I... Uh, get pause, show labels. Um, then you can see that each one of these pods has a label. And so it's going to route um, your queries automatically to that primary. Actually, I think I'm just going to wrap up here with, um, with this demo. I think this would be more valuable. So I created an application deployment. Um, what I did here, let me just show I have this PG client app. Um, this is very simple. So this is just an application container. Um, I have a Python app. It's connecting to, the, if this was an application, the application didn't need to know what the username or the password was. It's getting all of that from the secret. Um, and it's using the service, uh, Kubernetes service um, DNS name. And it's just running is um, is in recovery. And then that is a, right, so that is its own pod. So then I can just go to the logs here. And then I can see I'm connected to the primary. And I'm going to do a promotion. So um, CMPG has a plugin. It's got the ability to do a promotion. This would be the same, you know, if there's just if there's an automatic failure. Um, so I can go back and check my logs. So in this case, I'm always connected to the primary. Our reconciliation loops are coming in, um, and that and that label has been transferred to the newly promoted primary. Um, so our application missed one ping, and it's going. Sorry about that. It was going every five seconds. Uh, 
All right, um, networking again, it's a really big topic in Kubernetes, but you know, it, it gets a little bit more narrow when you just talk about the Postgres database. Two things you need to understand are all my applications going to be in Kubernetes? If that's the case, you can just use the cluster IP service type. Um, if traffic is coming from outside of Kubernetes, you can have a cluster type with um, which you're going to have to use an ingress. You also have the node port um, option, load balancer. You know, depending on where you're running, this is going to change. Um, if you're like in AWS, for example, the Elastic Load Balancer, the the one thing I would give you a heads up on. It becomes really easy in a lot of those cloud environments to expose your database um, to the internet. So um, be careful there. Um, also, what container network interface are you using? I mentioned the pluggable architecture. Those can really vary. You can have allow list, you can have deny list. They can be very much like your PGHBA comp, which is an allow list where you have a CIDR um, and what IP address you should I connect to. Um, this is what I just showed with the services. So worries put a label on our pods, and then our service is going to find which pods to route to. Change and tolerations. This is enforcing hard limits. Um, so an example I've seen before, we have a subset of um, Kubernetes worker nodes that are PCI certified. We have a PCI compliant database that needs to be come in. So the taint, so we taint the node and it says, this is a PCI compliant worker node. You know, it's got FIPS compliant SSL libraries, um, everything that's gone through the compliance. And then our pod puts a toleration, and that's the pass to get onto that Kubernetes worker node. Affinity, anti-affinity, this is about coupling, decoupling. So um, I have seen support cases where the number of instances was greater than the Kubernetes worker node, which at some point is going to cause issues. So you want to make sure that, well, one, that you have enough Kubernetes worker nodes, but that you're setting up rules to where your pods are being scheduled on different Kubernetes hosts. Um, you can also use this for things like availability zones. So you have like a Kubernetes topology. A single Kubernetes cluster can stretch across multiple availability zones, but not across multiple regions. So for high availability, you might put those on different AZs. There's also connection pullers, either the same node or very close, same with your application, just to reduce latency. Um, here's just an example. You can do require, you can do prefer, um, but in this case, this is going to make sure that each pod gets scheduled onto a different Kubernetes worker node. Um, last one is a bit random, uh, but managing Postgres versions. You know, I updated 16.3 to 16.4. That was really easy to do. If you have hundreds of Postgres deployments in Kubernetes and you have applications doing different versions, um, this can get really complicated really quick. Um, there are different ways to handle this. Um, one concept is like an image catalog where it's like, hey, you're running PostgreSQL 14. This is the container image that you need to do. You have to build in some logic to make sure that you don't have a thundering herd problem. And, you know, okay, we updated the image catalog and now we're having roll rolling reboots of our hundreds of Postgres databases. Um, you can also marry that up with something like maintenance schedules. Um, those are things that you need to, um, you know, push the operator developers on. Um, all right. Hopefully you picked up some useful tips, insights. Um, if you're ready to explore more, you know, um, most people in here said they were familiar with Kubernetes. Um, I wouldn't install Kubernetes yourself unless you're going to do something like Kind, which is Kubernetes and Docker. I really like um, Rancher Desktop. It'll give you like a, a vanilla Kubernetes version that you could use. You can deploy any of those operators that I mentioned earlier, kick the tire and see which one works for you. Um, it's really easy to, to get up and get started. Um, all right, I think we are at time. Okay, two minutes. Um, any questions? Um, I think there is another talk tomorrow um, that's on Kubernetes. I think it goes into, I try to keep it as generic as possible, but I, I think the talk tomorrow, um, I don't remember the title is, goes into a little bit more of the operator evaluations. So that might be something to look at, but again, really easy to get started and start testing. So any questions? Okay, we have one here. Hi, thanks for the talk, Zan. Just wanted to get your opinion on Helm charts uh, for deploying Postgres uh, instead of operator. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, so, so you get, yeah, I mean, I've seen Helm charts used for like bundling the app and your deployment together. Um, I don't really have a strong opinion on it other than it's a possibility. Um, you know, it was originally more imperative, but there's no reason why you can't do your application um, manifest, put that with a Helm chart with an application. So 
Um, I don't really have a strong opinion. I've, I've seen it work. I've seen plenty of, plenty of people be successful with it. So I don't have a real strong reason why you shouldn't use that if that's what you prefer. Thank you. And with that, we are done. We're out of time. Thank, Thank you. you.